Good evening, I'm Peter Mansbridge, and this is The National. Is your bank financial advisor really working in your interest? It could all depend on how you spell it. The industry has been able to incorporate titles that don't mean anything under the law. Questions arise over how well the authorities screen airport employees. As many employees have told me before, security is a joke at Montreal Airport. Plus, despite her continued danger, a former hostage gives new details of the ordeal that killed two Canadians. I did lots of things to save Robert's life, but it's not working. On paper, they sound impressive. They need to because your money is at stake. But what some financial representatives print on their business cards may mean the difference between putting you first or their employer's interests first. And the latest investigation from our Go Public team shows deception could even come down to one single letter in a title. Erica Johnson explains. It's hard for Mike Black to look at his financial statements. The nest egg he invested for retirement, almost a million dollars, has cost him more than $30,000 in fees and earned less than 3% a year for six years, lower than the market average. How is it that you end up getting a return of this kind over this period of time when this is to be managed by a professional? He learned the person managing his account at RBC Dominion Securities, an impressive-sounding vice president, is actually licensed as a dealing representative, meaning a salesperson. Quite uh, jilted by that. Uh, uh, you know, it's just kind of like, wow. Turns out the titles used by financial professionals are largely unregulated. A report released today concludes there are more than 120,000 registered financial professionals in Canada. It breaks down two ways. Dealing representatives, the vast majority, and advising representatives, only a few thousand. Dealing reps can call themselves anything from vice presidents to wealth managers to financial advisors spelled with an O. But only advising reps have a legal responsibility to act in a client's best interest. Financial advisors in this category spell it with an E. The industry has been able to, um, to incorporate titles that don't mean anything under the law. There's no such thing in Canada as an advisor spelled O-R under any of our securities acts. So people are completely in the dark. Two years ago, financial regulators anonymously shopped around and found 48 different titles being used by salespeople. For instance, at RBC, tellers now have the title Client Advisors with an O. A branch manager tells Go Public those client advisors are often young people who took an online course to sell mutual funds. When you've got advisors who are put in that position who, you know, don't, don't have experience and don't have the knowledge, um, then you're putting clients at risk. Other financial advisors tell Go Public their salespeople too. One at BMO says we are encouraged, if not forced, to sell our own products because we get paid more, even if it's not in the client's best interest. Most of the banks wouldn't comment on the titles they give their employees. RBC said it stands by the advice given to customers. Already there are calls to better regulate financial titles to clarify when the person handing out advice is a salesperson. Erica Johnson, CBC News, Vancouver. Erica and her team have been investigating sales tactics at banks for some time. Those reports are all online. But her stories start with you, and you can get in touch by sending an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. Airport security usually involves assessing the risk of travelers. But now a report is raising concerns about the people who work in airports and have access to secure areas. Today, the government tried to reassure the public there are no security loopholes. Alison Northcott has that. 30,000 people work at Montreal's Trudeau Airport, some in public areas, but thousands have passes to access restricted areas. Tyler Stout works at a duty-free shop. He says more should be done to ensure workers are not posing a risk. Definitely there should be more heavy security. As many employees have told me before, security is a joke at Montreal Airport. 
A report by the French language network TVA revealed at least four airport employees have had their security clearance revoked in the past year for security reasons, two of them over concerns they had become radicalized. The report says one shared ISIS propaganda on Facebook, another suggested committing a terror attack like the one in Paris. At least one of the four still works at a business in the airport but no longer has access to restricted areas. Airport officials say they responded quickly and that the airport is safe, but firing the employee is not up to them. If it's one of our employees, of course, the, that employee is gone. But uh, you have to understand that 30,000 people work at the airport for uh, different employers. Employees who work in restricted areas have to be cleared by Transport Canada, and that includes background checks by CSIS, the RCMP, and immigration officials. But they don't necessarily have to go through the rigorous security checks each passenger does every time they go to work. Instead, they're screened at random, with their passes verified daily. Every single day, every one of the people that works in the security zone, uh, we do a database check of police files and other things to make sure that they continue to be reliable. And the proof is we detected some problems. There are also questions about the police presence at the airport and whether six armed officers are enough to thwart a possible attack like this one in Fort Lauderdale. The federal government insists with multiple agencies in place, security is robust and says more than a thousand clearances for employees have been refused or cancelled at airports across the country over the past two years. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Canada's public health agency says 25 people in four provinces are sick with E. coli linked to now recalled Robin Hood flour. The all-purpose flour was sold in British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba. The affected product was 10 kilogram bags with a best before date of April 17, 2018. Ford is recalling more than 20,000 vehicles in Canada the company says the engines of four 2013 to 2015 models can overheat, potentially causing fire. Some of them also have faulty door latches that can cause car doors to open unexpectedly. In Washington, Russia is never far from making headlines. Two congressional investigations have been looking into how the Kremlin influenced the U.S. election. The House investigation apparently stalled by political infighting. The Senate investigation largely out of the news until today. Ahead of its first hearing tomorrow, senators tease some details. Paul Hunter has the story. If you're wondering what exactly U.S. senators are looking into as they dig into allegations of Russian hacking during last year's U.S. election, consider the words today of Democratic Senator Mark Warner, who's helping lead the investigation. As a former tech guy, what really concerns me is at least some reports, and we've got to get to the bottom of this, that there were upwards of a thousand paid internet trolls working out of a facility in Russia. Internet trolls are people who create and publish inflammatory postings across the internet meant to stir up emotions, including what's come to be known as fake news, fabricated stories that pop up for anyone to read unwittingly. As Warner put it today, they can then generate news down to specific areas. It's been reported to me, and we've got to find this out, whether they were able to, in effect, specific areas in Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. And during the campaign, some of the stories on Clinton deemed fake got ugly. Clinton is sick, or Clinton is taking money from, from uh, some source. Fake news. Add to that, he said, search engines manipulated to promote Kremlin disinformation. And if any of that actually influenced voters, now consider those three states specifically referenced by Warner. In an election night surprise and by slim margins, each was won by Donald Trump. And the value of those three states in the U.S. Electoral College was more than enough to put Trump over the top and into the White House. Then again, Trump campaigned hard in each of those states in the waning days of the campaign, something he credited as a key factor in his victory. Let's be clear, I'm not here to relitigate the election. But the fact we have, I believe, part of our responsibility as well is to put the American public on a higher level of alert that this time it was Russia, it could be other foreign nations as well. 
Don't forget, none of it's proven, but it's clear that's at least part of what the investigation will focus on. Among the first to pick up on Warner's comments, Russian state media, suggesting maybe the senator should learn how search engines work. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. There is shock and sorrow in Texas tonight. At least 12 people were killed when a small church van collided with a pickup truck. A statement from the First Baptist Church says the van was carrying 14 seniors returning from a religious retreat. It's not clear whether the lone person in the truck was among the casualties. Coming up, the invisible danger lurking in a lot of Calgary homes. First it was uh, how serious is the hazard. Plus, Canada's future military officers. A new report outlines the challenges they face. The Canadian senator under fire for her comments about residential schools was face to face with two survivors of the system tonight. Lynn Bayak has been outspoken about how the positive experiences of former students have been largely ignored. The survivors told a different story. The CBC's Katie Simpson was watching the meeting. As the residential school survivors arrived for their testimony at tonight's Senate committee, Conservative Senator Lynn Bayak kept her head down. Both survivors took their seats and then shared their horrific experiences in the school system. I lost my pride in being Cree. I was destructive to myself. I was suicidal. Members of the committee listened intently, but some also made a clear point of distancing themselves from Bayak. She was not mentioned by name, but several senators went out of their way to challenge her recent comments. And even today, there are some who refuse to acknowledge the full truth about Indian residential schools. We will not change people who are set in their ways today but we will change the young people. Peter Harder, the government leader in the Senate, says Bayak's comments are hurting efforts to improve the upper chamber's image. Absolutely, it's yeah. a kick in the gut. Yeah, and, and, and what do you do? You carry on by showing that the work of the Senate uh, is relevant to Canadians. Bayak is facing renewed calls to step down from the Senate's Committee on Aboriginal Issues after defending her position on residential schools and suggesting she understands former students' pain. I've suffered with them up there. I appreciate their suffering more than they'll ever know. I don't need any more education. I've been involved since we double dated when I was 15 with an Aboriginal fellow and his wife. Bayek also continues to stand by her original concern that not enough attention has been paid to the positive stories from residential school survivors. At a CBC town hall on missing and murdered Indigenous women last night, Bayek's words brought this residential school survivor to tears. I want to let you know it still hurts a lot. And, and I, want, I want this, this, this person... Lynn Bayak, please stand in my shoes. Late tonight, Bayak acknowledged her original comments caused harm. She didn't apologize, but did repeat her call for a national audit of finances on reserves to improve spending. Peter. All right, Katie, thank you. Hundreds gathered on Westminster Bridge today to remember the victims of last week's deadly attack in London. Supporters, faith groups, police officers, survivors, and family members of the victims came together in solidarity. Four people were killed and many others seriously injured when the attacker drove into pedestrians on the bridge and stabbed an officer outside the British Parliament. Today, the European Union received a letter from Britain that says, in a nutshell, I'm leaving. The British Prime Minister has invoked Article 50 of the treaty that governs the EU. It marks the official end of a decades-long relationship and the beginning of what could be a very bitter divorce. Nala Ayed has that tonight. At the appointed hour, Britain began the long walk away. Nine months after that historic vote, the Prime Minister started the countdown to exiting the EU. This is an historic moment from which there can be no turning back. Britain is leaving the European Union. The letter she signed, hand-delivered to Brussels, starts an unprecedented process. So here it is, uh, six pages. And a painful one. 
Brussels will be focused on limiting the damage to the EU club. There is no reason to, to pretend that this is a happy day, neither in Brussels nor in London. What began last year with a simple yes-no vote will, in the days ahead, become a profoundly complex negotiation. Today is a starting gun, but it's a starting gun for a marathon and not for a sprint. One that may be ambitious for the allotted two years. We want to negotiate future trade arrangements. They want to negotiate a divorce settlement. And it's only after we've decided what we're negotiating, and that might be months away, that we actually start negotiating. The world needs the liberal democratic values of Europe. Values. May has promised a Brexit that is smooth and orderly. Unlike some moments in Parliament today. But like clockwork, a closer Brexit is now, as critics warned, threatening to pull the United Kingdom apart. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. Loath to leave the EU, the Scottish Parliament voted to hold a second independence referendum. On today of all days, we should be coming together as a united kingdom to get the best deal for Britain. Well, I'm eight. Thank you. And even a bitter exit is better than one that's bad for the UK, says one of Brexit's biggest champions. Happy. I mean, today, for me, after 25 years of campaigning, the impossible dream came true. I'm very pleased. But even before the day had ended, the arguments had already started. What will get in the way of a new deal are some of the same reasons that Britain is leaving to begin with. For one, a decision will require the agreement of 27 other countries. Nala Ayed, CBC News, London. We get our first signs of how bad the breakup will be in one month at an EU summit where members will agree on formal negotiation guidelines. But before talks begin, two key elections have to happen in France and in Germany. With Europe's top leadership in place, negotiations can start in earnest. And unless everyone agrees to extend the deadline, two years from today, March 29th, 2019, Britain will be out of the EU. Brexit is already having an impact in the UK, one that supporters may not have anticipated. That's later on The National. Right now, stay tuned for news about a widespread household hazard. It is colorless and odorless. It is also the second leading cause of lung cancer in Canadians. And many people have no idea they're being exposed to radon gas every day in their own homes. In fact, a new study has found that in Calgary, one in eight homes have radon levels that exceed Health Canada's acceptable safe limit. Carolyn Dunn has more. When Bob and Ari McCauley moved into their 3,300-square-foot home in 2014, it was perfect for raising their growing family. Then, after seeing an offer to participate in a university radon study, they began to wonder if their home had come with something else. Years ago, I'd heard that radon is a health hazard. I thought, well, let's participate and find out more about it and see if it's an issue in the house. It was. The Macaulay's radon reading was nearly twice what Health Canada considers acceptable. Theirs is one of more than 2,300 homes across southern Alberta tested for radon during a study by the University of Calgary. Researchers found one in eight homes in Calgary contained radon levels higher than Health Canada's acceptable limit of 200 becquerels per cubic meter. That's a measure of radioactivity. The levels range from 200 to an astonishing 3,441 becquerels per cubic meter. The relative lifetime risk of lung cancer increases with higher chronic exposure. But that's not all researchers found. Newer homes had over, uh, about 31.5% higher average radon compared to older homes. Homes built in the past 25 years tend to have more square footage and are taller, so they act like giant chimneys sucking in radon gas from the ground. They also tend to be more airtight to save energy, so the dangerous radon gas is trapped in the home. The Macaulay's spent $2,500 to fix the problem. A pipe drilled through the basement floor and a sealed fan system have done the trick. 
uh, why not spend the money and, and make it basically read on free and eliminate the odds of uh, her and her little brother getting lung cancer. With 16% of lung cancers in Canada estimated to be associated to radon, the researcher's next frontier is developing tests to identify radon-specific cancers. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. Ottawa's police chief is telling his officers not to wear wristbands that support a colleague charged with manslaughter during their work hours. The wristbands are being sold by the Ottawa Police Association to show solidarity with Constable Daniel Monsion. They say, United We Stand, alongside Monsion's badge number. Abdurrahman Abdi died last July after a confrontation with Monsion and another officer. About 1,200 wristbands have been purchased. The police chief says community perceptions must be taken into account. The chief of the defense staff says there are no systemic problems at the Royal Military College in Kingston. But a report out today into alleged sexual misconduct and suspected suicides at the Cadet Academy points to issues around leadership and stigma around reporting mental health issues to superiors. Murray Brewster explains. I'm entirely satisfied with the report. The investigation into tragedies and troubles at Kingston's Royal Military College had the potential of blowing up in the military's face. I'm delighted to report uh, that you know there is no one single cause of concern. The report did, however, find cadets at the 140-year-old college were stressed out and cynical. The negative stressors centered on inconsistent leadership. The review was ordered last fall after a troubling series of events, a trio of suspected suicides, reports of sexual misconduct and harassment, including catcalls during a 2015 presentation to cadets by an advocate for sexual assault prevention, who had been hired to speak to them. The military insists it found no systemic problems. Whether it's related to suicides uh, or whether it's related to uh, harmful and inappropriate sexual behavior, uh, there would be um, far more indicators. D&D has struggled with the fallout of a report almost two years ago by former Supreme Court Justice Marie Deschamps. She found the military, including RMC, was rife with sexualized culture and most victims of sexual misconduct don't report it. Reluctance to stick up their hands when there's a problem, social or academic, is another thing stressing out cadets. Unfortunately, there is still a stigma attached to those that seek or want to seek assistance, as many are concerned about being perceived as being weak. It's all overblown, say cadets who agreed to be interviewed today. I think the media sometimes villainizes like what's happening here. From an officer cadet's perspective, the issues were not as grave as some people thought they were. It seems to me very unlikely, given particularly Justice Deschamps' findings about the high level of underreporting of sexual violence, that students, cadets, are going to come forward. Julie Lalonde is the advocate who faced catcalls from cadets two years ago. And so it's really disconcerting for me when you're hearing folks who are just newly entered into the military who've already adopted that mentality that you have to be stoic in the face of absolutely everything. And then there's the question of whether the military should have investigated itself at RMC. Both Julie Lalonde and Emma Phillips say no. Murray Brewster, CBC News, Ottawa. Coming up, new details from inside a tragic hostage drama. That was the last hug when I kissed him and they were keep telling me, stop, that's enough, that's enough. Kidnappers killed her Canadian partner. She tells her story to Adrian Arsenault. Plus, we uncover a hidden cost of Brexit. Time now to check today's business numbers. The TSX rose 59 points, the dollar closed up more than a quarter of a cent. In New York, the Dow lost 42 points. The price of oil went up more than a dollar a barrel. Wait a minute, the, the kidnappers had a family day? Yeah, yeah. I talked to the wife of the guy who did a beheading. I talked to her that, please, can you please talk to your husband? In 2015, Tess Floor became an unwilling player in an international hostage drama. She was held in her native Philippines alongside Western captives, two of them from Canada. She witnessed every grim twist and played a central role, 
trapped by circumstance and her emotional bond to one captive. Tonight, she shares new details with Adrian Arsenault, like just how close they came to rescue. Tess, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. You're the strongest, most courageous woman I know, seriously. As much as Tess Floor's Canadian connection haunts her, creates that shadow that falls over her sometimes, she doesn't want to ever let it go. Sorry, because every time when I see you, I feel crying. Cry. I know. It's a 15-hour time difference between Tess in the Philippines and Bonice Thomas in British Columbia, so talking isn't always easy. Are you, how are you sleeping? Are you having nightmares or are you sleeping? No. I, actually, sometimes I am still dreaming. I am still dreaming those those guys. Oddly, these two have never actually met, but they must one day. Destiny and death have forever linked them. Robert Hall is the connection, one of two Canadians kidnapped, then beheaded by the terror group Abu Sayyaf last year. Bonice is his sister, Tess, his girlfriend, who was captured alongside him, held until the ugly end. Keep talking, because it helps, doesn't it? Tess hasn't talked much, but she's starting. I am not really 100% free because I am still scared. Sometimes I am still scared. No! Can't blame her for that. She remembers what her kidnappers look like, and they know she does. They're still around. She told us not to risk going to her village, that it would be safer to meet in Manila, to share those stories of the big burdens on those tiny shoulders. Sometimes I regret because I, I, I was thinking that I did my best because I, I always, I did lots of things to, to help Robert, to save Robert's life, but it's not working. The tale of Tess and Robert started as a love story. They met online in 2014, then connected in person in the Philippines. There was time with her son, love letters, a ring, and great vacations on his boat docked right there on an island marina. That's where they were, September 21st, 2015. Around midnight, Robert got up to make popcorn and made an idle but ultimately disastrous move. He turned on a light. After he turned on the light, we heard banging outside. So I saw the faces and in, in the door of, of the boat. So there was four and they were having guns. A few boats over, John Ridsdale, coincidentally another Canadian, heard the commotion and rushed to help. The men grabbed him too, as well as a Norwegian managing the marina. That's them, all four hostages now, shoved into boats to be spirited away to one of the more remote southern islands. Tess started to listen to the kidnappers' conversation, knew immediately they were Abu Sayyaf. I talked to John, I talked to Robert and Chartan that this is it. This is what I think. I delivered a message to the Canadian government and to the... Of course, Abu Sayyaf are notorious for demanding huge ransoms than murdering those who don't pay up. Tess had to weigh what she would tell Robert and the others. So you were in this weird spot of having to translate... Yeah. ...for everybody. Yeah. She would have to keep it up for months, measure every word she said, don't upset the kidnappers, keep her fellow hostages calm. Robert and John were fixated on one hope, the prospect of a new prime minister. They, they were thrilled when Trudeau was elected. John and Robert said, uh, he, is, he is a very nice person. I know he, he can do something to save us. John and Robert, they are not really expecting for money, for a ransom money, but they were still expecting something, you know, you know. A rescue. Yeah, 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 that is, that is, that is a big percentage for Robert's uh, being optimistic. What Robert wanted was a Canadian Special Forces rescue, but that wasn't in the works. 
time dragged. The kidnappers became cocky enough to actually bring in visitors. I mean, the, the Abu Sayyaf, I saw some of their wives. Sometimes if they have a family day, we call family day because they have their wives, their kids. Wait a minute, the, the kidnappers had a family day? Yeah, yeah. So they they bring their families yeah, they to... Bring their family. uh, I talked to the wife of the guy who did a beheading. I talked to her that, please, can you please talk to your husband? Because, of course, he is our leader. Can you please talk to him that this money that they were asking, it's ridiculous. She also told me, okay, 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 Ate, I will, I will talk to him, I will talk to him. But I, I didn't trust them. I didn't trust them. There were no concessions. Life got even more dangerous. The Philippine military seemed to be going after Abu Sayyaf. Tess remembers nine assaults, bullets flying, and always wondering, maybe they'd be freed. But no. Sometimes we felt, we felt scared, of course. And sometimes we, after, after that fight, we, we said, oh, no, it's frustrating because we are still here. Tess's memory seems accurate because the Philippine military claims it was trying to rescue the hostages, and yes, there were nine assaults. We were near. Uh, many times we were able to hit the enemy, but unfortunately the kidnapped victims um, were not rescued because the enemy also have other tactics. The military sent us these photos, claimed they're of some of the Philippine casualties of all those efforts for not just the Canadians, but Vietnamese hostages reportedly being held nearby. And these aren't just injuries, but deaths. How many soldiers did you lose trying to rescue the Canadians? Well, what I can say is that I'll give you a range. That's from 30, uh, 30 to 35. Um, that range uh, from different time operations. Yeah. They lost their lives uh, trying to rescue the kidnapped victims, the Canadian kidnapped victims. How close exactly? Close enough, he says, it hurts to think about it. I can, I can generalize, tell you that it's just 100 or so, 100 or 50 meters, that close. A hundred meters in the jungle can be a long way. It does seem clear, though, the military had eyes on the hostages. Intelligence reports obtained by the CBC show even early on in the kidnapping, October 11th, Philippine intelligence had already identified that 250 men were guarding the hostages, were potentially shielding them briefly at a makeshift mosque. But those hostages were kept on the move every day for months. The day before the ransom deadline for John Ridsdale, Tess says the fighting got more intense. We've been attacked by the helicopters. So they've been panicked because they don't know, they don't know what they want to do because they told me that was the first time they were being attacked by the helicopters. The kidnappers tried, she said, to squeeze millions out of Ridsdale's family one last time. Then he was taken away in handcuffs. Robert, believing his fellow Canadian was just going home, until the sounds of the beheading video echoed in that jungle. Did you hear that videos? Did you did you hear that sounds? And Shartan said yes. So that was the time that we believed that they really killed John. Then came the calls about Robert. Tess threatened with beatings if she didn't talk to the English-speaking negotiators. I am appealing to the Canadian government, to the Philippine government. She begged the kidnappers for time. It's painful and I regret, and I'm sorry. Sometimes I blame myself, but they, my, my family said, don't blame yourself. It's not your fault. And I can still remember the last time we talked, Robert and I, the last time we talked, the last time, the last time I felt his hug. They wanted to bring Robert away from me. So Robert said that this, come on, give me a hug. So it was, that was the last hug. And I kissed him and they were keep telling me, stop, that's enough, that's enough. So 
He managed to slip her a note for his family, and then he was gone. The details of his death she keeps locked inside. Ten days later, the unexpected, a ransom was paid for the Norwegian, and a traumatized Tess was freed. The government of Canada is committed to working with the government of Philippines and international partners to pursue those responsible for this heinous act and bring them to justice. The RCMP insists an investigation is underway. No one we spoke with has had contact with Canadian investigators, and no updates are on offer. But we've learned this. The beheader, known as Boy Tattoo, is at large. At least two of the other kidnappers also took part in the beheading of a German tourist last month. The names and faces well known, but they have yet to be caught. And he was very happy taking pictures like this. And then there's Tess, carrying the pictures and notes from Robert always. She's struggling a bit with her health and with this impulse to always look over her shoulder. Yeah, I feel safe with you, and I hope you feel safe with me, that we can share, share our grief. To get away from it all, even for a while, to be with Robert's family is what they're all pushing for. I love you. I love, I love you. you. I love you. I love you. Be good to yourself. Mm, thank strong. you for your love. Thank you Bye for your us. love. Bye. Nothing's easy here. There can't be a visit until there's money for the trip, and no one's been able to raise enough of that yet. So she's a bit stuck with her memories as company, the very best of them, and the ones you wouldn't want to imagine. Adrian Arsenault, CBC News, Manila. Now, Adrian will have more from the Philippines. She will take us inside the fight for the country, on the streets and even online. Here's a preview. Death in the Philippines doesn't just happen now. Sometimes it feels like it happens by decree. My campaign against drug will not stop until the last pusher and the last drug lord are... Oh, he's really little. Yeah, he was made to kneel, yep. then shot in the head. You know, as an outsider, it can really look like there's a randomness to these killings, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Neighborhoods that draw up kill lists. Photographers who've become the ones who investigate and count the losses. Who's behind the killings might just be too dangerous to ask. <laughs> Families so poor they can't afford to bury their dead have to gamble just to pay for funerals. And a population, the numbers suggest, that still support this war on drugs. Is that support real? That story, plus fake news, Philippine style, coming in the weeks ahead. Right now, stay tuned for a brutal truth about Brexit. British business is hooked on European workers. The Article 50 process is now underway. The United Kingdom is leaving the European Union. For anyone in Britain who had been sleepwalking toward Brexit, today's announcement from the Prime Minister, Theresa May, was a wake-up call. But despite the fact the actual break from the EU is still years away, consequences have already kicked in. As Nala Ayad explains, amid rising uncertainty and a falling currency, Britain is changing. And if you believe May, there's no turning back. They're constantly on the move in a world that knows no borders. The lines within the European Union Baroque Orchestra are equally blurred. Among them, 13 nationalities this year. Their base has always been Britain, but home is Europe. All of our orchestras were born after the European Union was, was invented and, and, and so on. They're really used to moving across borders every day. It's one big workplace and they can live wherever they like. But that's changing, given the UK's decision to go solo. Unimaginable before that to young musicians like Julio Caballero. Well, it was the, the main topic of, for many weeks. And yeah, we were wondering what will happen with the orchestra. 
after this because we knew that something will have to change. Inevitable, because for one, the orchestra is funded by the EU. And the looming limits to freedom of movement could spell an unwanted finale. So they're not waiting to find out what happens. As Britain gives official notice to the EU of its intention to leave, they are sounding the final notes of an era and planning to leave too. The invitation came from Antwerp to think about relocating and the more we thought about it, the more sensible it seemed to take a strategic view now and make the transition as soon as possible. Shame on you. Brexit is going from dreaded possibility to looming eventuality. Its consequences for the estimated three million EU nationals living here, especially their free movement, are in some sectors already felt and lamented. Vital sectors, like the National Health Service, where the number of EU nurses registering has reportedly declined by 75% since the vote. An emergency in a system that relies on EU citizens, as this picture of just one surgical team shared countless times demonstrates. Even small movements in that proportion in the next few years as we train more people domestically would put some of our services at risk. It would mean delays for patients in terms of their treatment. Uh, it would mean uh, poorer availability of services in the community for people in their own homes or in residential homes. London's ambitious construction business has an escalating skills shortage and a looming threat to some 200,000 jobs. In hospitality, some like this chain are turning to summer teen internships to try to get ahead of any shortfall. I would say that one in 50 people that apply to our company to work is British. One in 50? One in 50. It is a pattern well known in the countless hotels here. At the thriving Georgian House Hotel, Brexit is seen as a broadside that will spare no one. British owned, honed and operated, it is near 88% staffed by EU citizens and has been for the 30 years Serena von der Heyde has run it. It's completely vital. I can't imagine how we would open our doors and trade if we didn't have our EU employees. Um, and the thought of it is, is frightening. So here we have our secret door. Mm -hmm. oh, cool. Yeah, let's go downstairs. Gabi Cardos, a Romanian citizen, is proud to work here. So what do you call this room? This is a wizard chamber. Here my colleague is finishing to clean. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Oh, I like, I loved working here. The price, though, is high. An eight-year-old daughter left behind with her parents, but the hard work pays off. How much more do you make here than you did in your professional job? A lot. So uh, now I can afford to, to, to live in here, like a decent life, and to send home money. So she isn't receptive to the future beyond the end of Brexit negotiations two years from now. Moving elsewhere means learning a new language, maybe starting at the bottom again. We are concerned that we need to go home. Uh, for me, personally, I don't, this is not an option, so I can't go back. We are working here, we pay the taxes, we don't have benefits, so I don't know why they want us to go home. Uncomfortable questions hang over the uncertainty shared by British and non-British alike. Boyan Cicic happens to be both, a British citizen who first came here as a student from Croatia. And uh, coming from a country where nationalist fervor took precedent over all else, uh, I know what, what that means for culture, it's just bad news. It is one of their last concerts before moving on. Hard to let go when it's been a lifetime's work. As it happens, I'm coming towards the end of my career. Um, and I, my intention is to make sure that there is a smooth transition to a new regime in, in Belgium and I, to, to secure the future. The future has arrived. 
a borderless world is starting to feel one country smaller. Nala Ayed, CBC News, Cambridge, England. Coming up, orange is no longer the new black. It's now a darker shade than you've ever seen. A new season of Still Standing, this summer on CBC. Looking at it can be unnerving. A special material described as the blackest black. And now scientists have made it darker. This is it. Looks almost photoshopped, right? You're actually looking at a three-dimensional object, but the material makes it so dark and featureless it looks like a flat circle. It's called Vanta Black, and the latest version absorbs 99.96% of visible light. It's not a fabric, rather a spray-on coating made with incredibly tiny tubes of carbon. Light can go in, but can't bounce out. The end result, a dark void you could get lost in. That's The National this Wednesday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Peter Mansbridge. Thanks for watching.